Good morning, everyone. Good afternoon, wherever you are. Um, I wish you all a, a happy Friday. My name is Martin Reinemann. I'm a professor at the University of Arizona. It's my pleasure to organize the speaker series on human-animal interaction. And today our speaker will be Dr. Evan McLean, who is a, an associate professor at our university here. Evan holds appointments in veterinary medicine, but also psychology, cognitive science, and anthropology. He is the director of the Arizona Canine Cognition Center for several years. Uh, Evan has uh, received a PhD in evolutionary anthropology from Duke, and his work is along the lines of evolutionary biology, comparative psycholo uh, psychology to address questions about the mechanisms through which companion animals represent and reason about the world and how they interact with humans. So, Evan, it's a real pleasure to have you here. We look forward to some of the new results that you have in, in your work, and um, the floor is all yours. Well, thank you very much, Martin. It's nice to be here with all of you. I'm actually not going to talk at all about animal cognition today. I'm going to talk about a different aspect of our work. So uh, I'm excited to share some of this with you. And I think everyone can see my slides correctly. Is that right? Perfect. Okay. All right. So um, very broadly, I am interested in the psychobiology of what is going on in a photo like this. So when we have these kinds of interactions with animals, um, I want to understand how do these social bonds that we have with animals get under the skin? So how do they affect us biologically? Uh, what are the neurobiological mechanisms that make these kinds of interactions rewarding? And how can we potentially use knowledge about the biology of human-animal interaction to advance its therapeutic applications? In my lab, we're very interested in the possible roles of the oxytocin system in human-animal interaction, and that's what I'm going to be talking about today. So as an overview for what I'll talk about in the next uh, 30, 40 minutes, I wanna start just by introducing you to the oxytocin system and telling you uh, why we think this is a particularly interesting biological system to study in the context of human-animal interaction. Uh, second, I'll present some recent empirical work from uh, my lab looking at uh, oxytocin pathways in the context of interactions between children and dogs. And then um, lastly, I'll tell you a few things about some future places that we want to take this work that we think will allow us to do things uh, more, power more powerfully than we can today. Okay, so uh, I'll start by just telling you a few things about oxytocin. And so oxytocin, um, first of all, what is it? Oxytocin is a, a neuropeptide that's produced primarily in hypothalamic nuclei. And it has functions in the central nervous system. So in the brain, it acts as a neurotransmitter. Um, but it's also released from the posterior pituitary into general circulation where it has actions as, as a hormone um, other places in the body. And so we have known about oxytocin for a, a really long time. And for most of the, the history of time that people have studied oxytocin, we've thought about it pretty much as a female reproductive hormone. So oxytocin was discovered really first for its ability to stimulate uterine contractions, um, which is uh, critical obviously for, for giving birth. Um, and for its roles in, in lactation, and specifically the milk ejection reflex. And I, I would say for the, you know, the, the vast majority of the time that people have studied oxytocin, they've kind of just put it in this bucket that, okay, this is a female reproductive hormone and, and kind of end of story. Um, but in the 1990s, scientists really got interested in potentially broader functions of oxytocin and began to think of this molecule really as, as a, a very uh, social neuropeptide. And a lot of that work uh, was done with these two species shown on the screen here, so prairie voles and montane voles. And um, the reason that scientists were interested in studying these two species is they're closely related, they live in similar places, but they have very different patterns of social behavior. So prairie voles over here on the left are sort of lifelong lovers. So uh, a male and a female meet each other, they form a bond, um, they raise litters of pups together, and they stay together season after season. So they have this enduring social bond that lasts, lasts their lifetime. Um, montane voles, in contrast, are animals that basically meet each other, they mate, they have babies, and then the male and the female split. They don't do anything after that together. And the next reproductive cycle, they find different partners. So they don't have these uh, enduring social bonds. So scientists got interested in the idea that by potentially studying these two very closely related species with different social systems, we might be able to learn something about the biology of, of selective and enduring social bonds. 
So I'll tell you uh, just a few things that were discovered in these early studies with bulls because they're really pretty incredible. And then I'll, I'll move from this into um, work in, in humans in the context of human-animal interaction. So um, what does oxytocin have to do with this? Well, it turns out that when, the, when prairie bulls form these social bonds with their partners, these bonds are facilitated uh, by mating. So when, when, when these animals mate, um, this causes a release of oxytocin, and that oxytocin release turns out to be really important in, in the social bond that they form. And we know this for a few reasons. So if you actually block oxytocin receptors um, when a male and a female are mating, this inhibits their ability to form a social bond. And if you put a male and a female together, you don't allow them to mate, but you administer oxytocin to the right areas of the brain in the time that they're together, then this uh, stimulates them forming a social bond. And what's really cool here is that if you make a, a species comparison between montane bulls and prairie bulls, um, these, these two images here are showing uh, cross sections of, of, of their brains and they're stained for the oxytocin receptor. And so what you can see is that relative to the montane bull, the prairie bull over here has, has a really, really dense distribution of oxytocin receptors in the brain. And some of the places that those receptors are, are in key reward areas in the brain. So um, this, this area right here is the nucleus accumbens, and that is a really central reward pathway in the brain that interfaces with um, lots of uh, dopamine pathways and serotonin pathways. And so this sort of uh, presented this idea that oxytocin could be a molecule that plays really central roles in the brain's ability to turn social experiences into rewarding things that motivate us to, um, to connect and to, to form enduring bonds with social partners. So since these original studies, um, we have come to learn all kinds of things about oxytocin outside the context of reproductive biology. Uh, so we know that in the brain, oxytocin activates a number of neural circuits that are involved in emotional processing and aspects of social cognition. Uh, oxytocin is frequently released in response to touch as a, a physical stimulus. It has important interactions with stress pathways in the body. So oxytocin tends to downregulate uh, activity in the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis, and it um, stimulates the parasympathetic branch of the autonomic nervous system. And at least in some contexts, um, oxytocin can increase feelings of trust and empathy towards others. It can decrease anxiety and sometimes has antidepressive effects. So um, these sound like really nice things. And if we could have a molecule like this floating around in our bodies, maybe we would um, enjoy what that would be like. Um, I have to give you a mandatory disclaimer, though, that there's actually a lot of nuance in these effects, and I don't have time to go into them today. So I'm not here to suggest that oxytocin is, is a panacea or that all of its effects are universally positive, but I think on the whole, it has many uh, salubrious properties. So one question that we have been interested in, in my lab is a question about um, whether human-animal interaction stimulates or recruits the oxytocin system. So when we look at the kinds of things that I just mentioned oxytocin is involved in, we talk about emotional processing, social cognition, response to touch, reductions in stress, um, you know, feelings of trust and empathy. These are all things that are really central themes in, in human-animal interaction research. And so I think that there's um, there are strong theoretical reasons to think that oxytocin could be involved here. And if it is, I'm interested in whether we can think about um, oxytocin pathways as mechanisms that human-animal interactions could have potential benefits. So uh, my group is certainly not the first group to think about this. And it, it, actually, as far as I know, the, the first studies on the role of oxytocin in human-animal interaction go back about two decades at this point. So there were um, some early studies where researchers put uh, people in a room with dogs and they uh, allowed them to act in, in, in friendly kinds of ways and collected blood samples from the people and dogs and found fairly reliable increases in uh, blood oxytocin in both the people and the dogs having these interactions. And so this stimulated a lot of interest in this area and suggested that, that oxytocin may indeed be responsive to human-animal interaction. Um, later work building on this uh, was able to demonstrate these same kinds of effects using non-invasive measures. So um, Nagasawa's group introduced measures of urinary oxytocin. Uh, my group introduced measures of salivary oxytocin in dogs. And these later studies also began to identify specific behavioral predictors of the, the oxytocin response during human-animal interaction. So especially things like social gaze, so looking into one another's eyes, this seems to be a, a sort of potent kind of behavior that stimulates uh, oxytocin release.
So um, there's a you know pretty good handful of studies that that support the hypothesis that oxytocin is involved in human animal interaction. Um, but I want to point out that not all studies find positive effects. Um, so um, these citations here are just three recent, um, somewhat recent papers that have failed to to identify the effects I just talked about, and. Really, this is a, a very, it's a nascent area of research. There's a lot of foundational work still to be done, even though I think the work that, that has been done is promising. So um, for the studies that I'm going to tell you about today, um, we wanted to do a few things. So first, we wanted to uh, focus on children. So all of the previous work that has been done on oxytocin in the context of human-animal interaction has been done with adult populations. Um, yet at the same time, really when we think about relationships with pets, these relationships um, may be incredibly important for, for children. So um, just a few examples I like to mention about, about the sort of unique role of pets in childhood. Um, many children actually report closer relationships with um, their pets than they do with their siblings. Uh, if you ask young children to just spontaneously tell you about their best friends, um, many young children will uh, just spontaneously name pets. And we know that kids um, rely on pets as confidants and comfort figures in, in times of distress. So, um, so there are a lot of reasons to think that these social relationships with pets may be really impactful um, during childhood. Second, we wanted to um, study relatively natural inter naturalistic interactions between children and dogs. So we wanted to uh, avoid the relatively uh, scripted scenarios that have been used in previous research. So previous studies, for example, you know, will uh, put somebody in a chair and they, um, you know, they uh, set things up to collect blood and the person has to remain there and there are certain things that they can and can't do during the experiment. We wanted to set up situations that are like situations that could basically unfold in the living room at home. When kids just inter interact with dogs in natural ways, we wanted to see what happens in these contexts. Uh, third, we wanted to do studies where we could look at a biological response in both the dogs and humans. So we're not trying to think about the dog just as a, a stimulus for the child or vice versa. We're trying to think about these as mutualistic social interactions where we are interested in the physiology of what's going on in both partners. And then lastly, we wanted to explore some questions um, looking at the role of partner familiarity. So many of the contexts in which oxytocin is uh, studied relate to individuals that have some sort of social bond with each other. So, you know, a parent and their child or a bonded emotional couple. And we wanted to look at whether any effects that we see in the context of human animal interaction actually depend on there being a social bond between um, the, the two interacting parties, or if we can, you know, pair a child with a dog they've never met before and get a similar kind of physiological response. So the design for the studies I'm going to um, present now. Um, so we had uh, 55 kids from the local Tucson community here, all between eight and 10 years of age. And those kids came into our lab uh, on three different, three different occasions. So it's a within subject study and they, they do a different experimental condition each time they come in. So on one condition, uh, they bring in their family dog and basically uh, we put the child and the dog in a room together. We just ask the kid to keep the dog company, hang out with the dog. They can do whatever they want for 25 minutes. Uh, we have a non-social control condition where the child comes without a dog. Uh, we put them in that same room. We give them access to uh, a bunch of age-appropriate toys and just tell them they can play and do whatever they want for that 25 minutes. So this is an example of a child, you know, playing with kinetic sand here. And then in the third condition, we bring kids in and they have an interaction with a dog that they've not met prior to the study. And so um, this dog here is actually my dog, um, Sisu. She's a... a, a a dog who was released from a service dog program uh, for a benign medical condition. So she has a really nice temperament, kind of gets along with everybody. And she was a constant um, for all of the children in this condition. So a lot of work for Sisu, but the, the kids I think enjoyed their time with her. Um, and then in terms of the biological samples that we collected, so from both children and dogs, we collected saliva samples at baseline and then 15 minutes into whatever activity they're doing. And we collected urine samples at baseline and then uh, 50 minutes after the onset of the activity. Um, we have uh, different timelines here for saliva and urine based on when we expect to um, basically see change in those matrices. They have a sort of different time course of response. So the key measures that we looked at in this study, so first in terms of uh, behavior, um, we coded uh, a bunch of different aspects of dog and child behavior using some ethograms that we developed for this study. 
Uh, really the two key measures to understand in terms of what I'm gonna talk about today are a measure we call affection interaction and uh, a measure of visual co-orientation. Co so uh, affection interaction, what is this? Um, basically these are principal component scores from uh, a model that includes variables related to proximity. So um, basically how close the child and dog are throughout the session. Uh, measures of petting, how much basically the duration of time that the uh, child is petting the dog, and the duration of what we call passive contact. And passive contact here is basically situations when the, the kid and the dog are in physical contact, but they're not sort of actively um, doing anything. They're, you know, they're leaning against each other or the dog is sitting in the child's lap and they're just sort of um, basically, you know, cuddling in some sense. Our measure of visual orientation is, is uh, basically a measure of shared gaze. So we are coding this anytime it appears that the dog is looking at the child's face and the child is looking at the dog's face. And we wanted to treat this variable separately um, for a couple of reasons. So one, it actually turns out that, that visual orientation is uncorrelated with these other measures in the affection and interaction variable. And then two, given the previous research suggesting that eye contact in particular may be a very relevant variable here, we wanted sort of a clean representation of that um, without it being lumped in with a bunch of other measures. Um, the oxytocin measures, so uh, we measure oxytocin um, using amino assays, and there's a ton of work that goes into this. It's a really hard molecule to measure, and I'm not going to talk much uh, about the details of that today. Um, but we're using ELISA methods that have been developed and validated in my lab, and uh, doing that with both saliva and urine at the time points that uh, I mentioned earlier. And then lastly, we have some epigenetic uh, measures here. And so specifically, what we're looking at is methylation uh, at some CPG sites in the promoter region of the oxytocin receptor gene. So the oxytocin receptor gene is OXDR, and then the M here is for methylation, and that's how I'm going to abbreviate this. Um, so, and these, these measures are done for, for humans only, and actually only in a subset of the kids. So we have 32 kids that have the epigenetic measures. Um, what do they mean? Well, we know from studies in, in humans and animal models that increased methylation in these regions of the oxytocin uh, receptor gene pr uh, promoter region are associated with decreased expression uh, of the receptor. Uh, and we also know from human studies outside the context of human-animal interaction that um, people with more methylation in these regions tend to exhibit reduced levels of social behavior and score lower on some measures of social cognition. Okay, so the um, analysis, I'll just go through this bit really quickly. Pretty much everything I'm gonna show you today, our, our models are Bayesian linear mixed models. Um, all of the predictor and outcome variables are standardized, so you can keep that in mind when you're looking at um, effects. And we used weekly regularizing priors for the beta coefficients in all these models. Um, the main things that we're interested in looking at statistically are Number one, uh, changes in oxytocin concentrations across time. For, so from that pre-sample to the, the post-sample. Um, differences in change from baseline across the different conditions that kids are engaged in. And here we have uh, one sort of special comparison that I'm gonna talk about a little bit today, which is a comparison that, that we think of as a treatment versus control kind of contrast. And basically what that comparison in, involves is um, averaging the two conditions involving human and normal interaction and comparing them jointly uh, to the control condition. And then lastly, uh, interested in questions about the relationships between these epigenetic measures and measures of oxytocin released during the experiment and uh, measures of child behavior when they're actually interacting um, with the dogs. So I'm gonna um, present some results from both uh, kids and dogs. I actually very uncharacteristically have much more to say about the kids today than I do about the dogs. Um, so I'm gonna start by focusing on the children and then I'll have just a few things to, to say about the, the dogs. All right, so um, the first result we'll look here is just a, a measure of uh, change across time. And so we're starting with our measures of salivary oxytocin in the kids. So just to orient you to the plot, um, what we're plotting here on the x-axis is the uh, change in standard deviation units um, from baseline. And then we have those estimates for the three different experimental conditions here on the y-axis. So let's get the bad news out of the way. What do we find? 
Well, we find something that is not what I would have predicted um, when we designed this study in that on the whole, salivary oxytocin concentrations are actually going down um, in all of these conditions from baseline. Um, though you'll notice the extent of this change differs a little bit between conditions and I'm gonna come to that in just a moment. Um, so why might this be? Why are we uh, seeing this decrease in salivary oxytocin from baseline? Um, I think the most logical explanation here is that although we're calling our baseline samples baseline samples, they're in many ways not baseline samples because these kids have just traveled to our laboratory. They're meeting people they don't know. They're in a potentially uh, stressful environment. And so uh, I think probably there's a lot of physiological arousal going on at baseline that even though we're calling these baseline samples are not sort of reflective of a, you know, a calm and unstimulated state in the child. So um, what if we look at the differences between conditions? So um, now we're turning to, so on the y-axis here, we're looking at basically the difference in change from baseline in the, the HAI conditions here compared to the control condition, and then in that treatment versus control contrast that I told you about. And so here we see something that is more encouraging. So in the, in the pet dog condition compared to the control condition, um, kids are exhibiting uh, greater oxytocin release uh, rel uh, from baseline um, when they're interacting with their pet dog uh, compared to the control condition. In the unfamiliar dog condition, we have an effect that is uh, going in the same direction, but with a little bit more uncertainty. Uh, the credible interval here includes zero. And then lastly, in this contrast, jointly comparing the HI conditions to the control condition, um, we, ha we have evidence that we're getting more oxytocin output in the HAI conditions. And so the, the effect size here is we're getting about a quarter standard deviation, greater oxytocin output when interacting with dogs compared to control. So um, if we look at variation among the kids in this study, is there anything in particular in their interactions with dogs that is predicting this response? And there is. Um, and interestingly, it turns out that in the pet dog condition, children who spend more time engaged in eye contact with their dogs have a uh, greater oxytocin output. And so this is a really nice uh, finding in my opinion, because number one, it replicates something that has been reported in adult populations before, and it establishes a similar kind of effect using salivary measures. What's also interesting about this effect is that we only find it in the interactions with, uh, with pet dogs. So when kids are interacting with their pet dog, the amount of eye gaze they have is predicting the oxytocin response. When kids are interacting with a dog that they haven't met before, we, we don't find this effect of social gaze moderating the extent of the physiological response. Um, if we turn now to the, to the urine results, um, so first of all, if we look at these measures of change across time, not a whole lot going on. So we don't have any, any strong evidence that uh, urinary oxytocin concentrations are increasing or decreasing. And so perhaps unsurprisingly, if we come over here and we look at the comparisons between condition, we also don't have any evidence that there are um, systematic differences between the conditions here. So uh, why would this be? Well, the, the first thing I'll note is that although we measured oxytocin in both saliva and urine, um, those measures are not correlated. And that is not uncommon. So th there are many challenges in measuring oxytocin. And there are lots of studies where when people try to measure oxytocin in urine, they get very different picture than what they get if they're measuring oxytocin in blood or in cerebrospinal fluid or other matrices here. So um, so I don't have a great explanation except to say that this sort of lack of correlation is not uh, uncommon or unprecedented. Um, and then the last results with the kids here, we can look at the associations between these epigenetic measures and oxytocin output here. So um, basically in the x-axis here, we're, we're plotting the effect of the extent of methylation in the promoter region of the oxytocin receptor gene on measures of oxytocin output in the three different conditions. And we have separate, separate panels here for saliva and urine. So what do we get? Um, well, we get some interesting things here. So the first thing that I'll draw your attention to are the effects in the pet dog condition. And so we've got, uh, I would say moderate evidence that kids that have greater methylation of the receptor gene um, actually have increased oxytocin output in their interactions with pet dogs. So um, the effect is a little bit different between saliva and, and urine and the, the credible interval includes zero in the salivary condition, but you can see that, that more or less we're seeing a similar effect um, in, across both of those matrices.
However, if we look at uh, what's going on in a condition not involving human-animal interaction, so in the non-social control where kids are just playing with toys by themselves, we basically see a trend toward the opposite direction. And it's, uh, again, one of these things where we see the effect stronger in, in, in one of our measures than the other, but the effect is going this, um, in the same direction in both cases. So um, it seems that there is a relationship between some of these epigenetic measures and measures of hormonal output here, but that relationship differs depending on the specific um, condition the kids are, um, are participating in. So now to add one more layer to this, if we look at these epigenetic measures and we look at, at a behavioral level, what are the kids actually doing with the dogs? So now we've got the, the two sort of main social measures here, the, the amount of time that kids are uh, visually co-oriented with dogs in the two conditions and the amount of time that they're engaging in affectionate interaction in the two conditions. Um, what do we see? Uh, well, up top here, not a whole lot. So not, not no strong relationships with the amount of visual co-orientation we see. But when we look at these measures of affectionate interaction, um, children that have more methylation of the oxytocin receptor gene are actually engaging in lower levels of affectionate interaction um, with, with the dogs. And this effect is, is most pronounced in the pet dog condition. And it's a pretty big effect, right? This is a, you know, about a half a standard deviation decrease in affectionate interaction per one standard deviation increase in methylation. So the thing now that you have to reconcile in your brain is that based on, on the previous slide, what I just told you is that the children that have more methylation um, are actually um, outputting more oxytocin um, in, in these conditions, or at least in one of these conditions, but they're simultaneously engaging in lower levels of affectionate interaction there. Um, so that's a tricky thing to think about. I have a few ideas, but if you have ideas, um, I would love to hear them. Okay, so I will um, turn now to some uh, dog results, and I've only got a few things to show you uh, on the dogs uh, because for the kids, this is a within subject study, and we can you know look at effects across three different conditions. For the dogs, they only participate in one condition, so basically, the you know the main things we can look at are are measures of change across time. So we'll start by um, looking at the measures of dog salivary oxytocin. And, and now our x-axis here is just change from baseline in the, the two different conditions. And what do we get? Um, well, we get opposite results um, depending on who the dog is here. So the unfamiliar dog, my dog Sisu, this dog that is the same for all of the children, is actually showing a decrease in salivary oxytocin from baseline to the um, tune of about you know a fifth of a standard deviation here. But when we look at kids' pet dogs, um, we're getting an effect in the opposite direction uh, of about the same magnitude. So the pet dogs are showing about a fifth of a standard deviation increase in salivary oxytocin from baseline. So I wanna say um, uh, a couple of things about this unfamiliar dog result. Um, and, and basically, I, I think there's a few things, I, I don't think we know where this effect is coming from, but I think there's a few things we can potentially rule out. So one, um, I think we can, probably rule out the possibility that the unfamiliar dog is having a decrease in salivary oxytocin sheerly due to the lack of a social bond with that child. And the reason that I say that fairly confidently is that we have done other studies um, with, with dogs from the same population where those dogs are interacting with people they've never met before, and we find increases in salivary oxytocin in that context. So I don't think it's just a matter of, you know, the dog doesn't know the child. Um, it could be some things about the way that kids interact with dogs. So certainly eight to 10 year old children do not interact with dogs in the same way that you, you and I might as an adult. Um, we monitor everything that's going on from video. So we of course make sure that the child is not doing things that are you know, too stressful or uh, you know, in worst case abusing the dog in some way. Um, but it's possible that children interact with dogs in different ways than we do as adults. Um, but we don't think that the dogs are stressed in this context because I, I'm not talking about this at all today, but we also have measures of salivary cortisol um, from both the kids and dogs in, the, in these contexts. And in the unfamiliar dog, salivary cortisol is actually decreasing across time. So it looks like we have a decreased stress response, but we also have a decreased oxytocin response. Um, and then lastly, and I think it really the maybe the, the most likely scenario and one that we just don't have data to look at is that this may be a function of the fact that this is 
for the unfamiliar dog, a, a repeated exposure kind of thing. So the unfamiliar dog participated in 55 sessions with 55 different kids. And it's possible that so, sort of through that repeated exposure, it, this is a very different situation than if dogs are doing this in a one-off kind of way, which is what's going on with the pet dogs. Um, the other thing to note, of course, is that because the unfamiliar dog is consistent for all of the children, um, even though we've got 55 sets of observations, it's effectively a study of a single dog, right? So if, if, if this dog, you know, responds in a way that is different than other dogs, we're just going to see a lot of that effect in this context. Um, if we look at the dog urinary oxytocin measures, um, so the unfamiliar dog here is giving us a consistent story uh, with, with the saliva results I just showed you and that we're seeing decreases in urinary oxytocin. Um, whereas in the pet dogs, um, we, uh, we basically have no evidence for systematic increases or decreases. Okay, so I want to just unpack a, a few of the things that I just showed you in terms of results, talk about some of their potential implications, and then tell you a few things about ways that I think we can do this kind of work um, more robustly in the future. So uh, first looking at our, our measures of salivary oxytocin, um, one of the things that's exciting about this study to me is that to my knowledge, this is the, the first study in which anyone has ever used measures of salivary oxytocin in people in the context of human animal interaction. And by and large, it seems like uh, you know, the, these measures work okay. So we have evidence that we have greater oxytocin release in the conditions involving interactions with dogs compared to control conditions. Uh, we were able to replicate some of the effects that have been observed previously, and specifically this effect of the amount of shared social gaze being a predictor of the physiological response. Um, and I think measures of salivary oxytocin have a lot of potential for different kinds of HAI design. So certainly compared to something like collecting blood samples, you know, I, I'm not sure the IFA would have let me do this study if I wanted to do repeated blood draws from children. Um, you know, if we're doing HAI studies and we are working with vulnerable populations, um, some of these invasive approaches just really constrain uh, the kind of research you can do, whereas saliva is easy, non-invasive, and I think uh, enables a wide range of research designs. Um, and then interestingly, in the, in the kids, um, we see relatively similar effects uh, across the condition where they're interacting with their pet dog versus a dog that they've never met before. And I think that that's an important finding when we think about potential therapeutic applications of human-animal interaction. So if we think about a scenario like this, where you know we have a sick child in the hospital and a therapy dog comes in to visit them, can that, can that dog elicit a similar physiological response to, you know, maybe this uh, child's dog at home who they've, they've known for five years or something like that? And at least based on the limited data in this study, it seems that, yes, um, th this can happen. And then uh, when we look at the dog salivary oxytocin results, so uh, I think quite nicely in the pet dogs, we replicate the effects that have been shown with other measures in previous research and that we're getting an increase in oxytocin across time during human-animal interaction. Um, the one caveat here is that the unfamiliar dog results go in the opposite direction, and I think they're really pretty challenging to interpret for some of the reasons that I have mentioned. Um, for our measures of urinary oxytocin, so we actually don't find what what um, some authors have found in the last decade or so and, and, and don't replicate research that has inspired a lot of people to do these kinds of studies and that we're not seeing uh, systematic increases in urinary oxytocin in either people or dogs um, during these interactions. Um, but I think it's important to contextualize these results. So as I told you earlier, we are not alone in, in not replicating these urinary results. There are a number of other um, studies that have not been able to, to reproduce those effects. And something I didn't have time to get into today are the, the, the really the methodological complexities of, of trying to measure oxytocin well. And so my lab spends an inordinate amount of time working on these measures and refining them, trying to find better ways to do things. And in the course of that work, we have identified um, what I think are some pretty big shortcomings with the ways that urinary oxytocin is often measured. So we have developed um, novel approaches that we think help get around some of those limitations and the work I'm presenting today uh, employs those improvements. So I, I do feel pretty good about the rigor of our measurements relative to um, some other uh, techniques out there. And then lastly, I just say that in terms of, you know, what does urinary oxytocin reflect and is this a good measure? I think really the significance of these measures is unclear. So ultimately only about 1% of the oxytocin in circulation is cleared in urine. 
Um, by the time it gets to urine, it may be degraded in ways that impact our ability to, to measure it. And as I told you before, um, urinary measures tend to not be strongly correlated with other measures, including those collected from blood. So uh, lots of question marks around what the urinary measures mean, in my opinion. Uh, and then lastly here for methylation of the oxytocin receptor gene. Um, so uh, this is, to my knowledge, the first study that has looked at any of this in the context of human-animal interaction. And we do find some interesting things although the findings are, are, are nuanced, right? So we find that when we look at the relation between these epigenetic measures and oxytocin output, um, well, if kids are interacting with their pet dogs, then kids with more methylation are actually producing more oxytocin. But if we put those same kids in a different situation, um, not involving interactions with dogs, they're exhibiting systematically lower levels of oxytocin output. Um, we also do find these effects um, between the epigenetic measures and aspects of behavior. And again, to my knowledge, the first time that any of these effects have been shown in the context of human-animal interaction. So specifically, kids with more methylation of the receptor gene are demonstrating lower levels of affection and interaction. And we see some evidence for this in in both of the HAI conditions. So regardless of whether it's with their pet dog or with a dog that they've not met before. And very broadly, this is consistent with other studies that have linked uh, greater levels of methylation to lower levels of social behavior and cognition. And I think it's really interesting to see some potential implications of that in the context of human animal interaction. So uh, I'm interested in these results, but as I said, this is really the first study to incorporate any of these epigenetic measures in the context of human-animal interaction. Um, so I think that basically what the current data tell us are that these measures are probably important, um, but the effects are also gonna be complex. And I think we're gonna need some, some really good and some powerful designs to tease out um, what, exactly what's going on here. All right, so I will turn to some future directions. Um, I thought I would show you a picture of uh, what my lab looks like um, before I get to my future directions. This is not what my lab looks like. I, I wish my lab looked like this. Um, okay, so what do we wanna do in the future? Um, well, again, I did not go real deep on the issues uh, related to measuring oxytocin, but uh, I can tell you that measuring oxytocin is incredibly difficult. And all of the methods that we have available currently um, face some pretty big challenges. And oxytocin is a very small molecule. It's a, a nine amino acid peptide. It's super dynamic. So it binds to other proteins in ways that make it hard to measure. It has a very short half-life between three to six minutes in plasma. And to, to measure it well is extremely challenging, expensive, and time consuming. So um, just to give you a sense of what the poor people in my lab have to do anytime we uh, run a study like this. So um, basically from the time we start working with a sample, the very first thing we have to do is we have to do a bunch of chemistry. Uh, we use an approach called solid phase extraction to try and clean up our samples and get rid of things that are causing problems in the analysis and concentrate the oxytocin. And then we freeze dry and concentrate our samples. Um, and, and this whole process takes about two days. And then we use these competitive assays to measure oxytocin, which themselves take about two days because they have these super long incubation periods. So you don't need to understand the details here. What you need to understand is that from the moment we start working with a sample to the moment we actually have some sort of quantitative result, we're looking at a week of, uh, of pretty hard work. And that's, that is a, a long pipeline to get a biomarker. So uh, we're thinking about not doing it anymore. Um, and we're, we're thinking about not doing that, not because we're lazy, um, but because we actually think we have come up with a potentially better way um, to do this. And I'll just tell you what that is really quickly. So we think that the, the better alternative here might be to rather than measuring oxytocin to measure a different molecule called neurofysin one. Um, so what is neurofysin one? Neurofysin one is actually the carrier molecule for oxytocin. Um, and so over here on the right, this is a schematic of the oxytocin gene. And you can see this little part of the gene right here is the nine amino acid sequence for oxytocin. And it's adjacent to this much bigger um, stretch of the gene that encodes for neurofysin one. So basically what neurofysin one does is it just, is, it just sort of um, stabilizes oxytocin right up until the moment oxytocin is released. And then in um, prior to release, oxytocin is cleaved from the neurofysin molecule 
And both oxytocin and neurofycin one are secreted at the same time. And they're, um, they're secreted in equimolar concentration. So basically what that means is that for every one molecule of oxytocin that is released in the body, there is one molecule of neurofycin that is released. So, um, so that's cool, but why would we be interested in neurofycin then? Well, we'd be interested in neurofycin because it's actually a much better biomarker. It's a really big molecule. It's 94 amino acids, and that allows us to measure it using some approaches that are just much better than what we can do with oxytocin. Um, and it also has a much longer half-life. So if we look at the circulating concentrations of oxytocin and neurofycin, half the time we can't measure oxytocin because the concentrations are so low. Um, but neurofycin is, is really abundant and we can measure it quite easily. So in the last, um, last two slides here, I just want to show you some preliminary data we have using this approach in another context that we think really suggests that these measures of neurofycin 1 could be quite powerful. Um, so this is work that was done in a part of a collaboration with uh, Elisa Bell, who's in the College of Nursing here at the University of Arizona. And we uh, took plasma samples um, from pregnant women, um, very late in pregnancy, and then in the first three months postpartum. And we know that in human pregnancy, oxytocin concentrations basically ramp up across pregnancy and kind of reaching their peak right before women go into to labor. And so we expected that if these measures of neurofycin were useful um, and really sort of track the biology of what's going on with oxytocin, that we should see neurofycin concentrations also being really high late in pregnancy. And that's exactly what we find. Um, and I'll point out that in this plot I'm showing you here, this is on a, a log scale. So actually we're seeing about a six fold increase in neurofycin in late pregnancy compared to um, the postpartum period. And that's, that's a really big and, and robust endocrine effect here. And if we take these same samples um, from pregnant women where oxytocin concentrations tend to be higher and actually pretty, uh, we can actually measure them pretty well, we find strong correlations between our measures of neurofycin and oxytocin. So um, I'm bullish on this approach. Um, and it has amazing advantages in that we can actually measure neurofycin in plasma and urine without any of these crazy complex pre-analytical things that I was telling you we have to do. Um, we can do it super quickly. We can, we can, from the time we touch a sample to the time we have a result is basically two hours. And we can reliably detect high concentrations of neurofycin in every sample that we have measured to date. So those are all amazing things. Um, there are disadvantages in that unlike oxytocin, it turns out that the, the sequence for neurofycin one varies between species. And all of the antibodies that we've been able to find don't work with dogs. So of course I discovered this great measure and it doesn't work in the one species in which I actually want to use it. That's my luck. Makes me feel like this dog here. Um, but uh, the good news is stay tuned because we're working on it. So we are working with a partner who's helping us develop a custom canine neurofycin one assay. And if that works, uh, I'm gonna feel a lot more like this dog on the, the lower side of the picture here. So uh, with that, I think I'm just about out of time and I wanna stop and, and thank really an amazing group of collaborators who have made this, this work possible. Um, I would uh, especially thank uh, Gita Nanadesikan, Katie King and Elizabeth Carranza who have, who have done tons of work to really just in the trenches to make this possible. And Stacey Teacott, who's a very close collaborator on this and then funding agencies who have supported bits and pieces of the work. And if we have time left, I'll be very happy to take questions.